Yes, so we might um, start our fourth session. So for the next session, I'm very happy uh, to welcome here Shin Fujinaka from Yako Nojo uh, in Miyazaki, who will be talking about Pandit and monks in Jain studies. So thank you. Thank you very much, Marie, and good afternoon, all audience. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the Pandit and the monks in, in Jain studies. Uh, uh, until the end of 19th century, uh, Jainism has been less known in the field of uh, Indology, which was mainly carried out in Europe. But in the past two decades of the next century, it became the more popular mainly because of increasing publication of Jain texts from India, though some of them are published sporadically at various places in India, where organized society or group were main sources of them. And the editor or compiler of such texts were mainly monks and pandit, not professor in university. Their works have been highly appreciated among the scholars all over the world because of the importance of the original texts themselves and excellent method of editing. These pandit and monks had no had so-called regular academic education because, uh, besides, with some exceptions, most of them had no English literacy. Here, I'd like to explore how and why they were able to ac accomplish such a brilliant and lasting achievement. Though there have been many giant scholars and pandit, today I choose three among of them, namely uh, Pandit Marbaniya, and Pandit Mahendra Kumar and Muni Jamubija. And uh, mainly I will talk about uh, Mahendra Kumar. First, I'd like to emphasize that among their common future, which made them uh, brilliant in field of Indology, the most important factor is, to my knowledge, their inborn intelligence, or in other words, that they were genius. Uh, personally, I had a good chance to have a lesson of Jain texts from Marbania as well as uh, Jambavijaya. Very deep impression of their high intelligence, which I received from them many times still remain within me. Many of foreign, foreigners, I mean the non-Indian scholars, who had taken lesson on Jain or Buddhist texts from them must have similar impression as I had. Because Mahendra Kumar died a premature death in his 14, I had no chance to meet him, but I can understand his inborn inter intelligence from the fact that he started his academic career at Siyadabad Jain Mahavira Vidyalaya Vanarasi in 1930. At that time, he was only 19 or 20. Can you imagine that just a BA student teaches at a university or a college? Now, let us discuss the method of attitude of scholarship and editing. First, to edit the certain work, they do not use single manuscript, but they try to collect manuscripts as many as possible, and utilizing them, our pundits and monks determine the most suitable reading and show variant readings in footnotes. For example, 
Take uh, Jaina Tarka Bashi of Yashou Vijaya, edited by Pandit uh, Skra Sangabi and Marbaniya and Mahendra Kumar, and published in 1939 as a uh, Sing Jaina series number eight. Uh, this, uh, this one. And Uh, editing this work, they used the three manuscripts and one printed edition in the in this introduction of this book. The, the editors mentioned the places of institute to which uh, manuscripts belong to and detailed information of them. Here you can see the, the description about the manuscript. Uh, from here, they describe the, the manuscript which they use. Before our pundits, generally speaking, the Indian editor used only one manuscript to edit a work, or even if they used many ones, they did not refer to that. Let's have a look at Agama Udaya Samiti series, which is published in the, published its first number in 1919. Uh, this is the first edition, uh, first, uh, first one in the Jain Agama Udes Samiti. There is no mention of uh, manuscript. They just started uh, the text. It must be noted here that Muni Jambujaji edited Hema Chandra's Yoga Shastra twice, the first during 1977 through 1986. The second is 2009. For the first edition, he was able to utilize only two manuscripts and one printed edition. But after two decades, other eight were available at his hand. However, it should be noticed here, even if there are plenty of good manuscripts available, a good edition does not come out automatically. Editor with excellent intelligence can be determine the uh, preferable reading of a sentence or a phrase. Anyway, our pundit maintain this attitude through their academic life. But we can't conclude that they were first Indian scholars adopted this met method. Moreover, it, should be the, it is sure that they did not innovate this. Most probably, they adopted this from the European Indologists like Herman Jacobi, who edited Jain Agam Acharanga, besides many other Jain works, using plural manuscript and published it in 1882. Uh, such a method of editing naturally leads to the, uh, preparing various footnotes. First, our Pandit and Muni note different readings of word or phrase in the text. And then they also give the explanation of synonym or difficult word. This is a kind of explanation must be uh, have coined by them because prior to the, them, Jain has, has a long history of such a method called uh, tipana or tabo, a kind of growth in the Western tradition. Here you can see a, in this Agama series, there's a, uh, uh, Bibarana or uh, Tipana, 
just uh, goes the alternate word or phrase. What shows our pundit or Ma Mooney's ex excellent ability in terms of the footnote is reference to the idea of terms that may have a relationship with word or phrase in the body of text. In a similar manner, they note the source of quotation in the body in square bracket. Uh, if, and if they identified, and if they cannot identify, they put only a square bracket. This kind of reference may be regarded as a one of a commentary, but making this, they do not put their opinion or understanding of the portion of body, but just show their knowledge to make edition more useful. And such work is only possible to the scholar who read various texts of Jainism as well as those of Buddhism and Hinduism and who has a, a good memory. Most of the texts edited by our Pandit and Munis contain various and useful appendix or parishista at the end of the text. Usually such an appendix begins with an alphabetical list of the verse or a sutra in the body. To prepare this kind of list is, as you can imagine, not difficult. But point is, they realize the importance of such a list for our research. Actually, many scholars find it very useful, especially when the body of the text contains hundreds and thousands of verses or sutras. We are not sure whether uh, the pundit innovated this kind of list or such had been compiled before, the, before them in India or in Western world. A glossary or a concordance had been compiled and made a part of index of text even in India before, before them, but alphabetical list of verses or sutras seemed a very rare in the early decades of 20th century. What makes us most surprised among the appendix is the list of quotation in the text. As mentioned before, the source of quotation is usually noted within the square bracket or in footnotes. Uh, correction of such note in the form of a list of quotation with uh, its origin is enough to realize as the high intelligence and wide reading of the editors. Moreover, I never come across such a list of list before them. Even if they were, only few scholars with excellent ability can prepare it. So the list of quotations with origin is the mark of brilliant editor. Now let us focus Pandit Mahendra Kumar and work edited by him. He must be less known than Marbania and Jambibijaya because of several reasons. The first one is the fact he belonged to the Digambara, and the second is that he was Hindi speaker with little in English ability. The third, the work he edited are most of on logic or Nyaya, not Agamas. But he should be more appreciated among the Jains as well as researcher on Jainism. How about looking at his life, we'll see the how Mahendra Kumar realized the methods mentioned above. Uh, born in Kurai near Sagar, uh, Madhya Pradesh, in 1911, he took his elementary education at Jain Patshara, located at Bina. After that, he joined Hankam Chand Jain Mahavidya Araya, 
in Dole, where he passed the examination in Nia Tilt and Shastri in 1929. Next year, he was appointed as professor of philosophy Sayadvada Mahavid Vidya Araya Banarasi. He taught there for 13 years and got the title of Nyaya Acharya. During this period, he edited several texts. He did some of them with co-editor as mentioned above. After a short stay in Bombay, he returned to Varanasi for founding project of Varatiya Junior Pit, which was founded in 1944. By the request of Pandit Marbaniya to the university authorities, he was appointed as a professor for Buddhism of BHU in 1949 and taught until the 1959, when he passed away. During his academic career of about 30 years, he edited about 10 giant texts written in Sanskrit. As mentioned before, most of them are work on logic or Nyaya, except the publication Shat uh, Darshan Samuch. As a, an independent writing, we have only one book titled Jain Darshan, published in 1955 as a volume of Sri Ganesh Prasad Varni Jain Grantamara in Varanasi. Besides this, he contributes several articles in Hindi for magazine. Uh, here's a list of texts in chronological order. He edited, uh, to my knowledge, he edited 10 works. Uh, all of them showed his superior intelligence, but we have no time to check all one by one here. So let us take a philosophical text edited by him to compare with previous one. Uh, Prameya Kamara Marutanda uh, or Prabhachandra is a commentary of, on uh, Pariksha Mukha Sutra of Mahen, uh, Manik, Manikya Nandin. The latter is a fundamental text of Jainiyaya belong to Digambaras. This text was, uh, this text with uh, commentary was edited by Bansidar and published in 1912 in Bombay by famous publisher Nirna Sagar. Here you can see the uh, name of publisher. Mahendra Kumar re-edited it by a suggestion of Pandit Sukral Marba, uh, Sukral Sangabi and Mr. K. Jain. The same publisher published this new edition with introduction and appendixes in 1941, as we, which we'll see afterward. Now, let us have a look at the first edition, I mean this edition. This was, as you can see, this was printed in a traditional uh, portif style. Uh, and forward or bodhigata uh, follows to the title page. This is a title page, and this is forward. And this cover only three pages in this. Uh, two authors and uh, related Jaina philosophers such as Samantha Badra and Akarankas are referred to. Here, 
Here you can see a name of Sri Samantha Badra and uh, his Manike Nandin. And here you, you can see the name Prabhatandra. Just three pages, and it starts here as a made uh, text uh, with a comment. Uh, this is a Pramaya Kamara Maratan. And in the, this uh, forward, we, we can't find any difference to the manuscripts the editor might have used. The body of text starts after the, this, the context, and uh, we see figure in Devanagari on the upper part of the line. You can see the number one, two, three, and so on. And here, we can see uh, Tippana to correspond the, the number here. Here, the, the Tippana of this part. This Tipana or Gross, whose author is unknown to me, uh, this, this text is, in a sense, uh, monotonous because editor seems to put the print from the manuscript. Though I fully understand that such a work itself is very difficult. Now, let me show the example of mono, this monotony. Uh, on the leaf of 25A, we read, here we read, Pramana Bhuta Bhuta E Iti Adina Kena Asav Stuyate. Here we can read. And here, Katamcha. Aparadi no asau ye na uchiya te tishtanti eva prada pradi na ye sham cha mahati kripe iti adi here you can see the two phrases iti iti adi in these sentences indicates that this portion preceding to them are quoted from some sources. Next page contains more clear example. Here we read Nanucha Akrame na api ekasi aneka kara beapitubam na ishate kim siat sa chitra chitrata ekasiam nasiat tasiam matao api. Yadi idam subayam artebiak lochiate tatura ke bayak iti abidanat. As much as it pains me because I love this text, you have to see it. Okay. Now uh, we can see the edi second edition uh, edited by Mahendra Kumar. This is a table of contents. You can see uh, the, the number of uh, introduction is so long, about seven, uh, 70 pages, covered about 70 pages. And uh, here is the index of uh, uh, appendix. And this is the same portion uh, which we have seen. Here, Pramada uh, Bhutaya is the same uh, quotation. So he indicates here, this is a quotation from Pramada Samucha 1. one. And this is the same portion, and here, uh, he printed it in uh, two lines. 
And he has mentioned that this, this is a quotation of Pramana Samutya, chapter 3, 2, 1, 0. So, uh, this kind of uh, explanation or indication of uh, quoting is just can uh, possible by a very uh, brilliant and wide reading scholar only. So to conclude, uh, this presentation, I'd like to propose a plan. There are still uh, giant texts on logic to be edited with a me modern method which uh, Mahendra Kumar took. From the Gambra side, we have these texts. Uh, some of them are mentioned by uh, uh, in the morning, but and from uh, Shibetan side, we have this Prame, uh, Pramana and Satvaru Karan uh, Aroka with uh, old commentary issued about the Latunakal. And nowadays, even one of these works is too heavy to be there with uh, by a single scholar. However, we, ha we have useful equipment or systems such as a PC or internet which are not available in the day of our pundits and monks. Therefore, uh, some research, some scholar can cooperate internationally to compile the better edition of these works. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this great lecture. It's very important to, to, to know what is still to be done. Uh, and so we are pleased to welcome our last but not least speaker of the day, uh, Stephen Vos, um, who will be speaking um, about what seems to be uh, the most perfect introduction to our next uh, roundtable. So from gynology to giant studies and back towards a dialogical approach to scholarly engagement with giant communities. I let you the floor. Thank you, Mary Elaine. Is this all right? Can you hear me fine? Good. Uh, yeah, as I was thinking about this, um, my paper here when uh, uh, Peter introduced the topic about the uh, sort of 20th anniversary here of the Jane Studies Workshop, I kind of took that perhaps a little too literally and thought about, you know, what has the state of our field been? And uh, for those of you who were at the EASR conference in September, a lot of this will sound familiar to you. Um, but I've been thinking a bit since I am now the Bhagwan Mahavir Assistant Professor of Jain Studies at Florida International University, and uh, never thought I would be, um, that sort of trying to figure out like how my job is actually different from sort of a typical assistant professor's job. Um, uh, as many of you know, the Jane Studies program at Florida International University was endowed by a foundation called the Jane Education and Research Foundation, which is a group of uh, Janes from around the United States who got together finally and endowed the Jane Studies professorship there, which includes an endowment that gives us some programming money. So we have, um, of course, the Mahavir Jayanti lecture that uh, Professor Balbir and Dundas, uh, Court, and others have uh, graciously given, and um, yeah, as an assistant professor and someone who kind of uh, came up through the ivory tower um, and thought of himself as a scholar and not as much more than that, uh, I've found that I've also had to play the role of diplomat, which I don't know I'm particularly good at, but I give it a shot anyway. Um, but really, my training uh, and my inspiration for joining Jane Studies as a field came from uh, Whitney Kelting. And as an anthropologist, the thing that I liked the most about her approach was that what she wanted to um, portray in terms of what the Jain tradition is, is how people live it. And this lived religions approach has really, I think, dominated American scholarship uh, over the last 30 years. Um, and I think also a little bit in Europe as well. 
Um, and I was just, uh, you know, as I was thinking about re my remarks for today, I dug through my old uh, actual paper file of articles that I keep uh, from one uh, John Court, among other scholars here, and found his uh, 1988 uh, correspondent to the uh, Center for the Study of World Religions at Harvard Divinity School. Um, and he was the foreign correspondent then, because he was doing his dissertation research 30 years ago uh, this year. And so really, the lived religions approach is 30 years old now, we can say that. Um, and the article that he wrote is called Pilgrimage to Shankeshwar Parshvanath. And the thing that really has stuck out with me is that he gets on a bus, and there's other Jains on this state transport bus uh, going from Patan to Shankeshwar. And as the bus starts up, uh, they say, Bolo, uh, Bhagwan Shankeshwar Parshvanath ki jai. Thank you <laughs> for illustrating a point I'm about to make here. All right. And, and his point in, in doing this is to say that the way that we've been studying Jainism in the Western Academy up to this point as a sort of a series of abstract doctrines and beliefs, uh, scriptures and philosophies, um, has actually missed a great deal of what we mean when we think about um, what it actually means to be a Jain. Um, most significantly being um, what is devotional life? What kind of emotional connections do Jains actually uh, forge to the relationship um, of what we call the soteriology of moksha, right? And so, you know, much of his work has inspired Whitney Kelting, it's inspired me, I think most of, uh, you know, us today, and I know especially uh, Thilo de Tigue, and a lot of the people at Ghent um, have been transformed by this lived religions approach. So this is not just an American thing, although I know the American situation best, and that's why I talked about this as an American thing. Um, but there's a remark that John makes a little later on in this article, where he says, the average Jain is no more a systematic theologian than the average Christian, and there's no such thing as a Jain seminary or divinity school. Nonetheless, there is, or are, a Jain theology, and Jains are very insulted when described by scholars as atheists. They do not believe that God created the world, but rather that God showed the way out of the imperfect temporal world to the soul's true state of infinite knowledge, power, bliss, and consciousness. They do very much believe in God, and it is that strong belief that motivates the hundreds of thousands of pilgrims who come to Shankeshwar every year. And he goes on. Um, and what I find very interesting about statements like that um, is that I think it encapsulates what we call the lived religions approach uh, very nicely. Um, and one important aspect of that that I think is actually deeply ethical, that the lived religions approach is at its heart a kind of an ethical intervention in scholarship. Um, and that it's an attempt to show the Jain tradition in a way that's not just an abstract set of sort of doctrines and beliefs and so forth, but an actual living, breathing religion that people who profess to be Jains could actually see themselves occupying. Right? And I think that, um, yeah, the ethical nature of that intervention, I think, has kind of run into a new impasse based on some of the things that I hear from my donors. So my first year when I formally took over as the Bhagwan Mahavir Assistant Professor of Jain Studies at Florida International, um, I met with the board of donors as I do every spring. And one of our donors had said of uh, Professor Phyllis Granoff and Professor John Court and Professor Nalini Balbir and Professor Paul Dundas that it's wonderful that we have all of these scholars who come and very eminent figures who come and, and give these lectures but um, they're all studying things that are really not Jainism. And they're really inessential, like art and literature and women. <laughs> we want real Jainism. Give us real Jainism. So I was like, oh boy, I've got a lot of digging to do here. Um, and so I invited Professor Jai Sony for the next year, who gave us a lecture on Jain philosophy, just like they wanted. Um, and so I realized that my, part of my job here as the you know, the, the professor of Jane studies here is to actually try to bridge a gap between uh, what I think of as a, a deeply ethical movement within um, the representation of the Jane tradition as one that is about people. Um, and I think Paul Dundas's book in 1992 was called The Janes and not Jainism for a very specific reason, that we were trying to show that the field is evolving in a way that is much more oriented toward people. Um, up against, my donors who, the last thing that they really want us to study is Jains. 
right? They want us to study Jainism. Um, and so I felt like, my goodness, I, maybe I don't belong here after all. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to sort of sort my way through this right now. So I've been thinking a lot about um, how we can actually come up against the fact that, like, really, some Jains would prefer that we don't study Jains and that we do study Jainism. And so they have sort of a kind of an unease about seeing themselves as kind of the object of study rather than their, their tradition, right? And so I've started thinking about how some of my colleagues who say do Jain philosophy, and I as a historian feel like I'm kind of in between these two things because I don't actually study living people anymore. I kind of study people who once lived and the traces they've left behind. Um, but thinking about how my colleagues who do philosophy actually work very well collaboratively with Jains on sort of working on material together. And whether that might be a kind of a new step forward for the way that we as scholars write and the way that we think about who our audience is uh, when we write our, our works on Jainism or about Jains. And so I was thinking particularly of people who, like myself, go to India on our research years to write our dissertations and our books, and we work very closely, you know, as Professor Fujinaga just nicely showed, right? Um, we work very closely with Jain intellectuals there in India who usually can't leave the country because they're you know, monks or nuns or have other restrictions that prevent them from being able to travel clearly. Um, and so we work with those materials and we work with those people and the knowledge that we produce, we try, and you know, I mean, it's usually produced in a European language, so it has a limited circulation among Jain communities in India. Um, but we try to, uh, I think, do right by the people that we work with on the whole. And so, you know, if we are this invested in um, sort of the ethics of how we represent the tradition and the people that we study, um, as I really see that the lived religions approach was trying to foster you know, in the late 80s and through the 90s and into today, um, then I think that all of us really take this challenge seriously about how it is that we're going to continue to represent um, the tradition that we study. And maybe that actually has to do with taking a more, what I'm calling a dialogic approach, right? Because the thing that, right, so the question here in, my, in the title of my talk was from Jainology to Jain studies and back. Um, and to me, the answer to that should be no. Right. We shouldn't actually go back to Jainology, really. Um, and I think Atul's question earlier sort of pointed this out. Isn't there a sort of an indological bias in the project of creating an encyclopedia? Right? And I think that all of us attend to that question very seriously and would try to think about an encyclopedia that is not sort of another indological object, um, but rather something else. Right? I think all of us were deeply influenced by Edward Said's Orientalism and uh, Ron Inden's sort of Imagining India and have tried to really rethink how it is we go about studying who and what we study. Um, and yet, the world religions approach, I mean, sorry, the, the lived religions approach is still very much based on a kind of world religions model of, of knowledge production, right? The audience for our works is still very much um, sort of a scholarly community or a, scholar, a community of students, depending on the level at which we pitch it. And, so the idea that uh, sort of we're producing knowledge about Jainism to fill a gap in our understanding of world religions. So in a sense, right, even the lived religions approach is somewhat based on the idea that what we're trying to study is the human phenomenon of religion, right? We're studying homo religiosus, and the particular form of it that we're studying is Jainensis, if you will. Um, and perhaps that model has run its course. And so by refiguring the lived religions approach toward this dialogical model of writing and speaking, I think that what we can actually do is to help um, scholars uh, engage with the increasing fact that Jains themselves are the audience of our work, um, both as donors to university programs and also in the fact that the diaspora community is expanding and there is a great interest in scholarship. Um, in sort of the Western academic model as a valid way of knowing about Jainism. And that goes as deeply as, you know, some of my, you know, Jain neighbors in South Florida call me up and ask me to give lectures at, you know, the local Jain center there. I do it once a year at least. 
And I frequently feel like I'm stuck in the middle of some sort of debate that's going on that I don't know about. Where they, so what is the right way to do this puja? Right? Like, uh, however you say, right? And like, my job is really to sort of, is not to adjudicate what is the right and wrong way to do things or what is the correct or incorrect belief, but whatever you say is the debate that's, that you're having and it's my job to sort of observe that and pay homage to the fact that there is a debate going on within the tradition, right? And so what I think might be very helpful in terms of a new model of how we write, if we think about this more dialogically, is to say that, um, you know, who actually has the power to represent Jainism, right? Because one of the things that I, I think that a lot of Jains see is they want to see Jainism as contributing to the ongoing debates that we're having in so many fields, right? Environmentalism, business ethics, uh, so on and so forth, right? And Jainism can contribute meaningfully to those debates. Um, also that there are debates going on within the Jain community in diaspora situations, um, and in India as well, uh, in which you know, power, questions of power are always going to come up and are perhaps elided um, through the effort to try to say, well, I, just, I want this represented. This is what I think Jainism is. And we may not realize, or some people may not realize, that in fact there are many, ver many, many versions of Jainism. And to say like this one is going to be privileged over another um, is actually slightly problematic. And I think that what frequently happens when scholars who are not Jain try to intervene in those things, I, the pushback I frequently hear is, well, you don't really understand, right? Um, Issues of feminism, for instance, are not actually present in Jainism. There's no such thing as a Jain feminism. And feminism is sort of both alien to and unwelcome in the discussion about what Jainism should be. And yet, I also, when I go to Jaina, the Jain, uh, Jain Association of North America conference, I see young Jains who are, frankly, upset with some of their elders um, in terms of how they feel like they have been pushed into one particular form of, of the tradition that may or may not be working out for them. And so for them, actually questions of gender and power and class are actually deeply part of the conversation they would like to have and are not actually capable of having. And so I think that if we are able as scholars to have a more reasonable conversation about how things that we have been classically interested in as academic interests like gender, class, power, so on and so forth, can actually contribute to the ways that Jains, especially living in the diaspora, can uh, sort of take part in those debates and actually recognize them as part of how it is they're going to uh, help their children become, see their tradition as part of the mainstream of, say, American society or British society, um, then I think that that's actually a new way that scholarship can be useful to an audience that is increasingly interested in us. And from there, I know that we'll have a roundtable debate as we go forth, but uh, that's, those are my remarks. Thank you.